what are the top five things you can do for a healthy long life? What is my current training routine like? And what are the macronutrients that I consume? This and a lot more in today's Q&A episode. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram where I do those Q&As there regularly. It's showtime. All right, the first question is top five things to do for long, healthy life. Now, I do believe that it mostly comes down to the fundamentals. Like there is very little evidence that any of these super fancy things like fancy supplements or fancy exercise routines or fancy diets have any you know, significant effects on lifespan and longevity. It mostly comes down to nailing down the fundamentals and uh, making sure that you don't like get a particular chronic disease early in life because the biggest thing that determines your you know maximum lifespan pretty much comes down to when are you getting these chronic diseases that most people die to like if you look at the top killers worldwide then they're heart disease stroke and uh, neurodegeneration cancer diabetes and those kind of things in developed countries in developing countries there are obviously like these infectious diseases as well but in developed countries the western world generally it comes down to non-communicable diseases like heart disease cancer diabetes and neurodegeneration and when you look at the average age of heart disease then it's pretty much around 65 years the average age of a heart attack is, is 65 the average diagnosis of cancer is also around 65 to 70 and the average diagnosis of uh, neurodegeneration and dementia is around 80 years of age so most people the reason why heart disease is the number one killer is because most people die to heart disease around their 60s and 70s and uh, that is kind of the biggest bottleneck in terms of determining your maximum lifespan <laughs> like if you get heart disease in your 60s then it's very unlikely that you will live to 100 years old for example whereas if you get you know heart disease maybe a few decades later like in your 80s or 90s then the chance of you getting to 100 is still quite high and this is what also you find in the centenarians the centenarians are divided into like three main groups there are these survivors these people get a particular chronic disease whether that be cancer heart disease or neurodegeneration before the age of 80 and they still make it to the age of 100 then there's the layers those people are the ones that don't get a chronic disease up until the age of 80 years old so they make it to 80 and then after that they get a chronic disease and then they still make it to 100 and then there's escapers these are the ones that don't get any of these chronic diseases uh, up until the age of 100 so these are the kind of pure you know most genetically best blessed or with the most healthiest lifestyle that avoid all these chronic diseases up until the age of 100. so the biggest rate limiting step to how long you're going to live is heart disease primarily like most people will die to heart disease like one out of three or four people will die to heart disease and this is the biggest like bottleneck in your maximum lifespan so for optimally living longer and healthier it comes down to making sure that you don't get these chronic diseases and this is a topic of my next book as well um, which is called the longevity leap and the idea behind that is that in order to live longer you need to shorten the gap between health span or health adjusted life expectancy which means the age or the duration of a life living disease free and your maximum lifespan and in so doing you would also be able to see an addition of a few extra years to your lifespan by doing that so making sure that you avoid the chronic diseases is comes down to prevention preventing yourself from getting the chronic diseases that is what is pretty much the most powerful way to ensure that you live longer and uh, obviously it's also the most powerful way to ensure that you live longer disease free which improves the quality of those life or of those uh, years so the longevity leap is going to just talk about yeah how do you bridge the gap between your health span and lifespan and how do you delay and postpone these chronic diseases uh, with uh, the proper lifestyle uh, like habits and those kind of things but you know chronic diseases heart disease neurodegeneration cancer diabetes they are you know lifestyle diseases obviously there's genetics that contributes to that but it's lifestyle and a lot of you know dietary practices metabolic health your fitness all those things contribute to that so taking a step back what are the like the top five things that you can do to live a healthy long life it comes down to yeah disease prevention and delaying those diseases so what i would put the top five things into this list would be making sure that you're not overweight is probably like one of the top ones 
because obesity being overweight, it increases the risk of all the chronic diseases. Like it increases the risk of diabetes, neurodegeneration, cancer, and heart disease quite a lot. And an obese person is expected to live around five to 20 years shorter because of uh, the accumulation of these comorbidities and the uh, development of these chronic diseases. Most people might not die to obesity per se, but they die to heart disease, but they get heart disease because of being obese, for example. So make, make, making sure that you're not overweight and obese is quite crucial, in my opinion, maintaining like an optimal BMI and uh, optimal body fat percentage. You don't want to be overweight. You don't want to be obese. You don't want to have this uh, excess amount of visceral fat as well. So even if your BMI is normal, but you have a very high waist circumference, then you're still metabolically sick because of the high amounts of visceral fat. And the visceral fat is actually one of more more relevant in terms of uh, metabolic syndrome and poor metabolic health than actual BMI or actual like body fat percentage. So, you know, waist, waist circumference, body fat percentage, and making sure that you're not overweight and obese is number number one, I would put for sure. Then the second thing would be maintaining like a physically active lifestyle. Exercise is the most powerful, you know, activity for even like protecting against obesity like if you are physically very active then you are probably you're, you're like a risk of developing obesity and becoming overweight is also much lower and exercise itself also has many additional longevity promoting effects like exercise pretty much targets everything that you need for longevity <laughs> like it protects against heart disease it protects against neurodegeneration protects against diabetes protects against uh, obesity protects against uh, cancer and it also slows down the speed of biological aging. So it maintains your biological youth for longer by activating these different longevity pathways and obviously maintaining a phys physical, let's say, body that is also younger and healthier for longer. If you have higher muscle strength, higher VO2 max, higher flexibility, all those things, then they are indicative of biological youth, if that makes sense. So you age slower and you maintain uh, the physical function of someone who is decades younger by staying more physically ap active for longer and maintaining like a higher level of a fitness. The third thing is to eat like a balanced diet. I don't believe that there is any, let's say more of these like uh, on the spectrum diets <laughs> or which whichever direction the spectrum goes, like either a plant-based super heavy vegan diet or a carnivore diet, animal-based diet. I think both of these spectrums miss the mark of what, what it means for longevity. For longevity, you don't want to be eating obviously too many carbohydrates, but you don't want to be eating too many fats either. So it comes down to like a balanced macronutrient split uh, that's what I've come to the conclusion of after years of research and years of, you know, trying out different diets myself as well. I think like a macro split, which I'm following right now as well, of something around like 25% protein, 40% uh, carbs and 35, 30% fat is probably like the most optimal macronutrient split. Like a Mediterranean diet is obviously the most evidence-based diet for heart disease and brain health. And I think that, you know, something very similar to that is also probably the best for longevity. And, uh, you know, eating a wide variety of plants and animal foods and dairy products and some grain, whole grains as well is probably the most kind of optimal way of eating. But the most significant, you know, the overarching principle of diet is the calorie intake, because it doesn't matter what kind of diet you follow. If you're overeating calories and you start to gain weight, you start to accumulate fat and visceral fat, especially, then it doesn't matter what kind of diet it is. It's still bad for your longevity. So any diet can work to a certain extent, uh, granted that it maintains a normal calorie intake and granted that it keeps you at a normal body composition as well. You don't want to become overweight and any diet that makes you gain or become overweight and obese is harmful, even if it's a healthy food uh, diet. So calorie intake is king when it comes to diet and then kind of uh, opting for a more like a balanced macronutrient split is what I do right now. And I think generally is, you know, most, uh, at least based on the evidence, is going to give the most benefits for longevity as well. Number four is a very important point as well, because this is what most people, you know, give themselves heart disease with, <laughs> which is smoking. So smoking is very bad for, you know, pretty much all chronic diseases. It's the biggest thing that contributes to heart disease and even cancer and neurodegeneration as well. So smoking is definitely like a zero tolerance policy there's no healthy amount of smoking like any amount of smoking is actually very harmful for you and in one particular study they found that smoking one cigarette per day 
puts you at 50% of the risk of heart disease as smoking 20 cigarettes per day. So even just smoking one single cigarette per day puts you at 50% of the risk as smoking 20 cigarettes per day would. So you can imagine that, you know, any amount of smoking is bad. And even a single cigarette puts you at a significantly increased risk of heart disease. And uh, it's almost as bad as smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Obviously, there's a huge difference between 1 and 20 cigarettes per day in terms of how much you need to smoke. But in terms of the risk, it's only 50% the same. And uh, there's literally like no benefits to smoking, especially the most con conventional uh, cigarettes that you see. So I have a zero tolerance for smoking and... Uh, alcohol consumption as well you know there's a lot of controversy about is moderate alcohol consumption healthy can you get away with one to two drinks or something like that you know it's it's confounded by some of the epidemiology studies that find that the individuals who don't drink alcohol at all they're at a higher risk than those who drink moderately alcohol i'll tell you right now that you know those those studies are first of all epidemiology studies they uh, obviously don't take into account the health use of us and uh, there's also the problem that people who can't drink at all they might have some other health conditions that prevents them from drinking so they're already at a higher risk of mortality so alcohol is also something that has no health benefits you know i think if you do drink you could get away with maybe one to two drinks per week if you drink like three nights per night then that's already too much <laughs> i think like you know two drinks per night is also too much but if you drink like one one drink let's say on monday the second drink on friday or something like that then you can probably you know you can get away with it it's not going to have any adverse effects but uh, generally alcohol is also something that in my book in my you know worldview and philosophy is also zero tolerance that it has no health benefits and it only increases the risk of you know whatever kind of a disease it is especially um, fatty liver disease so yeah, alcohol and smoking, we want to avoid those things as much as possible and, you know, ideally never do it for the rest of life, at least what I think. And lastly, the last point is stress management because chronic stress is something that does aid you quite a lot. We're not talking about, you know, shortening your lifespan immediately, but stress just uh, accelerates biological aging. So you start to gather or, you know, you start to accumulate the age-related comorbidity is much faster like if you're stressed out all the time then your blood pressure is probably higher your blood sugar levels are probably higher and over the course of decades it's not you know the chronic stress isn't going to kill you in months or years it takes decades of being chronically stressed out to accumulate the stress related comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes and uh, kidney disease and those kind of things so managing stress is quite important from the perspective of biological aging that you want to make sure that you're not stressed out and there's many things you can do to that you know to manage your stress you know spending time in nature taking the sauna you know having a dog playing with your dog or something like that all those things can help to lower your stress but the biggest thing is probably yeah just avoiding the unnecessary stressors in your life there's many necessary stressors in our life you know many most people have to work they have to earn a living they have children those are kind of necessary stressors <laughs> like you can't you know eliminate your work you can't eliminate your family or something like that uh, but you what you can do is still manage the other unnecessary stressors like your environmental stressors your you know exercise related stressors as well like don't overtrain if you're already stressed out because of work so manage your exercise in a way that prevents overtraining and make sure you fill your bucket or like empty your stress bucket bucket with downtime like you know spend time doing things that you enjoy don't always just you know go 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 in this mode take time to spend in nature there's a lot of research showing that nature bathing spending time in nature is very beneficial for lowering stress and strengthening the immune system and just you know the light exposure the grounding the clean air all those things are good for your longevity as well so nature bathing is pretty underrated but it's very powerful for stress management and longevity as well and uh, lastly like some of the more positive hormetic stressors like the sauna maybe a little bit of cold exposure as well can train your nervous system to be more resilient against stress if you overdo it if you overdo the ice baths every day for you know months upon end every day ice bath every day sauna then yeah you might become stressed out but in moderation they can actually obviously increase your hrv which increases your resilience against stress 
but also boost parasympathetic activity, which is the kind of um, you know relaxed rest and digest state of your nervous system, as opposed to being in this uh, sympathetic uh, state, which is the stressed out state. This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. The next question is best protein and most absorbable. Well, if you look at the like actual just biochemistry, then the most bioavailable and the most absorbable protein is probably whey protein. Like it always tops the charts in terms of bioavailability and the protein synthesis response. It tops egg protein, it tops plant-based proteins tops beef protein etc whey protein is the most anabolic kind of a protein there is now does it really matter like protein bioavailability and protein absorption or the speed of absorption it only matters in a certain situation like it only matters if you're eating a low protein diet or if you're like malnourished or if you're yeah like a professional athlete who just really needs to get highly bioavailable and highly absorbable protein very fast to recover from the workout or to prepare for the next workout. If you're a regular person who eats adequate amounts of protein, then it doesn't really matter how bioavailable the protein is. If you're getting sufficient amounts of protein, so if you're getting at least 100 grams of protein per day, 110, 20, even 150 grams of protein per day, then it doesn't matter what's the bioavailability because you're getting such a large amount of protein that your body will just get all the amino acids that it needs uh, to cover protein synthesis and to maintain muscle tissue and to, you know, build muscle tissue as well at that point. So the larger your protein intake is per day, then the less important the quality of the protein is. If you're eating a protein restricted diet, like you're eating only 70 grams of protein, 60 grams, 50 grams, then the more important the quality becomes because you're already at a smaller intake of protein. And it has been found that at adequate doses it doesn't even matter what type of protein it is whether that is whey protein or plant-based protein or beef protein or casein protein whatever it is you 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 might you might just need more if it's lower quality so for example 30 grams of whey protein uh, to get the equivalent response for protein synthesis from a plant-based protein you might need like 40 or 45 grams of plant-based protein so you need less protein in total the higher the quality is so if you're eating an animal-based diet, then you actually need less protein because the protein is higher quality. Whereas if you're eating more plant-based proteins, then you need a little bit more protein to make up for the quality, if that makes sense. But at sufficient amounts, the protein synthesis is the same and the final outcome is also the same, if that makes sense. If you're eating, let's say, 110 grams of protein from animal-based sources, then that's the equivalent of maybe eating 150 or 160 grams of protein from plant-based plant-based uh, sources and vice versa if you're eating you know 150 grams of animal-based protein then 110 grams of plant-based protein is worse <laughs> you know obviously because it's less protein but it's the quality matters at that point as well but if you're eating 110 grams of animal-based protein then uh, you know that's pretty much covers all the demands for maintaining muscle tissue and uh to get the same response from plant-based proteins or something that is less bioavailable, even like beef protein powder, for example, compared to whey protein, then uh, you would need a larger dose. So like 150 grams. Next question, do you have a training plan or split or you just do random stuff (laughs) and listen to your body? Uh, Well, I definitely don't do like random stuff. Um, I have a plan that I follow. It's not specifically in my notebook that, okay, this is exactly how many reps and sets I need to do, etc. What I follow is a push-pull-leg split. So three days of the week, I work out with uh, resistance training and I cycle between push muscles, which are chest press, shoulder press, maybe triceps, things like that. Pull uh, muscles, which are pull-ups, deadlifts, uh, rows, and leg muscles, you know, squats, lunges, 
uh, Bulgarian split squats, uh, even Romanian deadlifts and those kind of things. So I just cycle between these three main muscle groups and you don't really need more than three workouts per week. You know, working out more than that is actually counterproductive in my opinion. It's certainly counterproductive for longevity purposes and it might be counterproductive for even muscle building purposes unless you are you know, taking anabolic steroids or something. <laughs> if you're a natural athlete, then working out more than four times a week is probably overdoing it. And you would you would um, you would be getting more benefits from incorporating more cardio at that point. Once you get three workouts of resistance training per week, then uh, you don't need more than that, and you would be better off adding some cardio, in my opinion, for longevity purposes at least. Uh, for muscle building purposes, it might be a bit different. But yeah, I follow a push pull leg split, and uh, sometimes I'll do you know barbells, sometimes I'll do calisthenics. Sometimes I'll do dumbbells or kettlebells. So it just depends on the situation. But what I do still follow is the cycling between push muscles, pull muscles, and leg muscles. What I actually do is probably push muscles, leg muscles, pull muscles, maybe leg muscles again. And I, I try to cycle between upper body and lower body. So I never do like two upper body days in a row because it's kind of overkill in my opinion. So I'll do either upper body, lower body, or, or something like, you know, upper body, cardio, upper body, lower body, cardio. So I'll try to kind of uh, keep some variety in there and never train the same muscles, you know, twice in a row, if that makes sense. In terms of the reps and sets, then uh, my main focus is going to be mostly strength-based movements. You know, I'm out of my kind of desired body composition in terms of muscle mass. I don't want to build additional muscle mass. Like I'm pretty above average with my muscle mass already and I don't want to add like I don't need to add any extra muscle tissue and I would much rather keep my body fat percentage low and focus on the strength based movements because the strength based you know looking at the research then strength is more important for longer longevity whereas muscle tissue you know yes it does go down with age but if you train for strength then you're going to have plenty of muscle tissue as well so you should you know primarily focus on the strength trying to get stronger because strength is more of a reflection of health whereas muscle tissue is more of a reflection of you know what you eat and how much protein you eat generally <laughs> like you can build muscle on any kind of diet as long as you're getting enough protein like you could eat like just twinkies and get a protein shake and still pl build plenty of muscle and you know i mean same applies to strength as well to a certain extent but over the long term you know looking into decades into the future then what matters more is going to be strength in my opinion and uh, having more strength also means that you will have plenty of muscle tissue as well so i like to focus on strength so i'll train low on the lower rep ranges mostly like three to six reps per set and uh, three to six sets per exercise as well the exercise i do like very little exercises i do maybe th three exercises per workout so if it's a push workout i'll do uh, bench press and shoulder press and maybe like some dumbbell flies on the side or delt flies as they're called on the pull workout i'll do pull-ups or deadlifts and maybe forearm curls that's it only three exercises that's it takes me 30 to 45 minutes i'm done for the leg muscles i'll do only squats and maybe uh you know bulgarian split squats or something like that and i'm pretty much done as well so you don't need to spend hours at the gym it's actually counterproductive in my opinion and uh focusing on strength is uh i think more important than just focusing on the muscle mass what are the best glycine sources in uh, vegetables so uh plant-based foods generally don't have a lot of glycine they don't have a lot of methionine either which is good so from the longevity side then maintaining a balance between methionine and glycine is beneficial so making sure that you don't get too much methionine and not enough glycine if you eat only muscle meat then you're going to get a lot of methionine and probably not enough glycine so you want to balance that with some of the collagenous proteins like pork skin chicken skin drumsticks bone broth gelatin powder those things have the most amount of glycine and they don't have that much uh, methionine when it comes to plant-based foods then yeah the thing with plant-based food is that they don't have almost almost any methionine at all and they have very little glycine as well but the but the ratio is pretty good like the ratio between methionine and the glycine on plant-based foods is uh, pretty good so i do like to include obviously a lot of vegetables and different kinds of foods in my uh, diet uh, specifically the highest glycine rich foods that are vegetables are you know soybeans are actually probably one of the highest uh, vegetable source of uh, glycine and the 
lat in Latin, soybeans mean glycine max. <laughs> so that's kind of an interesting uh, translation that soybeans mean uh, glycine max, but they're not really the highest source of glycine per se, like pork skin or gelatin powder is the absolute highest amount of glycine from dietary sources. So, you know, soybeans, beans itself, legumes, they have, obviously they have a little bit more protein than broccoli, for example, but they have more glycine as well and less methionine. So these are the kind of the most plant-based uh, foods that have the most glycine, but you shouldn't rely on getting that much glycine from just plant-based foods. It is true that your glycine demand on a plant-based diet is probably smaller than on a meat-based diet because the plant-based foods also have very little methionine, so you need less glycine to balance the methionine, but you still need at least 12 grams of glycine for collagen turnover. So if you are eating only plant-based foods, then you're probably not getting those 12 grams. So you want to add like either a gelatin powder in there or you know eat some of the other, you make collagen peptide supplements as well, or just eat some of the other collagen rich uh, proteins like pork skin, chicken drumsticks, and those kind of things. Next question, what are the three best supplements everyone should take? I think number one is collagen peptides because you start to lose your skin collagen content already in your 20s at a rate of 10% per decade. So it's like if you start taking collagen in your 40s and 50s, then it's already too late in terms of that because you have already lost at least 20% of your skin collagen content. So the earlier, earlier you start with collagen peptides, the better. And this is one of the supplements I think like everyone should take for the rest of their life. I don't see, at least in terms of the aesthetic side, because it helps with, there's like multiple human clinical trials showing that collagen peptides improve skin aging and slow down the hallmarks of skin aging. So it's a pretty well, well researched supplement in that regard. And the second supplement I would probably add is, uh, I would say like, you know, glycine, <laughs> because, you know, you get some uh, glycine from collagen peptides, but it's not nearly enough. You know, I personally take at least five to six grams of extra glycine on top of my already existing diet. And uh, the specific brand of collagen peptides I take also has five extra grams of glycine per scoop. So I'm getting like eight grams of glycine per scoop of my collagen pro protein. So I'm still like supplementing at least 10 grams of glycine per day from all the different sources, from supplemental and the collagen sources. So, but you know, yeah, the demand for glycine for optimal anti-aging, I think, yeah, is around 10 to 12 grams per day. Uh, you could get that from diet as well. Like if you eat a lot of gelatin powder, then yes, you can get it. Uh, just drinking like a cup of bone broth <laughs> isn't enough. Like you're not going to get, it's a research that uh, you can't get uh, adequate amounts of these uh, collagen precursors from uh, bone broth. You would need like either a higher pork skin diet or something like that, or to just uh, supplement with collagen peptides or uh, extra glycine. And the third supplement, you know, whether or not you need to take it depends on your age and depends on the other factors. I'll put, I'll name two supplements here. They're going to share the spot for number three is they're going to be NAC and melatonin. Now, everyone doesn't need melatonin. Everyone doesn't need NAC, especially if they're younger than 40 years of age. It's been found that, you know, your glutathione levels decline rapidly after 45 and your body is able to resist oxidative stress before the age of 45. But after the age of 45, the glutathione levels rapidly decrease and that's where you start to see also the age-related diseases and you start to age much faster as well. So if you are over the age of 45, then I would certainly take NAC every day. Like uh, the Glynac and NAC combo, glycine and NAC, it also is very you know, researched. It has many uh, trials showing that it reverses hallmarks of, of uh, human aging and improves functional outcomes such as muscle strength and gait speed and cognitive function. So, uh, you know, someone in your 40s and 50s and 60s, I would take NAC at large doses as well, pretty much every day, like five grams even, because that's what's been shown to uh, help with the hallmarks of aging. The same with melatonin. You don't technically need melatonin in your 20s or 30s, but in your 50s, you would certainly need to take like, a, I, would, I would certainly take um, at least like one milligram of melatonin per night because your melatonin production decreases with age similar to glutathione and you make around 10 times less melatonin when you're 50 years old compared to when you're in your puberty and uh, you know 
melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant. It has many anti-inflammatory benefits. So something, if you are, you know, trying to age the most optimal way for longevity purposes, then yes, melatonin in your 50s is something I would, yeah, certainly take every night pretty much. But before that age, you know, I prefer to take like a smaller dose every now and then. I don't take it every night, but uh, yeah, like just trying to boost your antioxidant defense with like 0.1, 0.3 milligrams melatonin uh, before the age of 50 is also a good idea in my opinion. Next question. I know vaping is also harmful, but it's like 90 to 95% safer than traditional smoking, right? <laughs> Better to avoid though. Um, you know, yes, vaping might be slightly better than regular smoking but at the same time it's equally as bad <laughs> so you know you might not be like causing that much ox chemi uh, mechanical oxidative stress to your lungs as you would with a traditional smoke or a cigarette but you are still causing chemical oxidative stress <laughs> through the inhaling of these vapors that have obviously these different kind of chemicals in it so they're both equally as bad in my opinion like i don't know who came up with the idea that vaping is safer than smoking. Like the research doesn't really back that up. It might reduce your risk slightly compared to traditional smoking. But remember what I just said before, even smoking a single cigarette per day puts you at 50% of the risk of heart disease as smoking 20 cigarettes a day. So let's say you do vaping, you know, most people don't vape just once a day. They might vape five to six times a day then vaping five to six times a day is probably as bad as smoking one regular cigarette, probably a bit worse. So that already puts you at 50% of the increased risk of heart disease as smoking 20 cigarettes per day. So no, like I don't think vaping is safer <laughs> in the long term. It's certainly, In the short term, it is safer, but in the long term, it's equally as bad in my opinion. And uh, yeah, you know, don't vape. It's kind of very bad for you. It's kind of useless thing. It's certainly not healthier than regular smoking and uh, yeah just try to avoid these kind of uh, activities whatever kind of smoke it is like the hookah pipe that uh, or the water pipe that's very bad Reg regular smoking of cigarettes that's bad you know there's some some um, ideas that smoking cigars where you don't inhale the smoke is somehow safer uh, i haven't found any research to back that up but I would say that, you know, even smoking the cigars over the long, over the course of decades is still very bad for you. <laughs> I don't think it's, you know, safe that it somehow prevents you from getting an increased risk of heart disease or cancer. Like over the course of years and decades, you will still probably see the same increased risk, maybe, maybe a few percentages smaller. But like I said, even smoking a single cigarette per day puts you at 50% of the increased risk of 20 cigarettes per day. So just e any amount of smoke any amount of smoking activity from whatever source it is, is bad. <laughs> and, you know, you should have like a zero tolerance policy, in my opinion. Next question. Can you take creatine even if you're not working out? That's an interesting and good question. So creatine obviously is the most popular supplement for muscle strength and muscle building. But creatine has a lot of other health benefits as well and longevity benefits. Like it improves brain it reduces sleep demand, it supports methylation, and uh, it's also been found to have like some anti-aging and longevity benefits in the elderly through maintaining muscle strength and muscle mass and also improving cognitive function. You know, yeah, taking a creatine supplement, even if you're not working out, is probably still worth it and it will give you some benefits. If you are working out, then you will probably see, you know, more results from creatine supplementation but that's also because you're working out. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't matter if you're working out or not, you would benefit from creatine, uh, at least in some way. If you're not working out, then you would see probably a better result in terms of your, or you would notice more improvements in your sleep and uh, cognitive function. But if you are working out and you take creatine, then you will obviously see also increased muscle strength and muscle power, maybe a little bit of muscle mass as well, or through the intramuscular water retention. Uh, so yeah, you will see benefits from creatine, even if you're not uh, working out, in my opinion. Maybe the dosage would be somewhat smaller if you aren't working out. So if you're working out, then you would, you know, the kind of good safe dose to take is like three grams, five grams if you're a heavier male. But if you're not working out, then maybe like two grams already is enough. So I wouldn't, I don't think it's kind of good idea to take very large amounts of creatine, like 
10 grams or something like that is kind of not uh, needed. You might get gastrointestinal symptoms from very large amounts of uh, creatine and it might, you know, uh, over the long term might impair your kidney function as well. But if you're taking only like two, three, five grams, then that's a safe amount. It's just that if you're not working out, then your demand for the creatine is also a bit uh, smaller. So because creatine is used for ATP production, speci specifically the phosphocreatine system, which is the kind of maximum anaerobic performance. So if you're not engaged in a lot of explosive and strength-based activities like powerlifting or sprinting or stuff like that, then you don't, then you're not like burning through your creatine that much uh, either. But you would still gain the benefit uh, from the cognitive aspects of uh, creatine. And the next question is uh, similar to the smoking topic. <laughs> so. Uh, nicotine without tobacco good or bad so nicotine is an interesting substance obviously you get nicotine from cigarettes you get it from cigars i guess you know some uh, vapes also might have some nicotine in it i'm not sure i have never uh, like actually vaped uh, but you know you can get nicotine from nicotine gums nicotine patches and these nicotine sprays as well so nicotine the i guess the biggest benefit to nicotine as a compound alone are its nootropic effects so it can have some cognitive enhancement benefits like it can improve your focus and attention span uh, i personally use the nicotine gum every once in a while i think i use it maybe like once a week or something like that and uh, it's a it's a pretty good like a compound for yeah like doing cognitive work it can increase your like focus a little bit put you into the zone quite nicely if you combine nicotine gum with a little bit of coffee then that's a pretty good nootropic. Like you can be in the zone for, for many hours by doing that. But uh, nicotine in large amounts, it can also have some negative side effects. Like it, it's actually vasoconstrictive. So uh, it reduces blood flow. So chronic use of nicotine in large amounts probably isn't that of a, is not, is not a good idea in terms of cardiovascular disease. So from the brain health side, small microdoses of nicotine is good. It uh, can improve like cognitive function. It might even have some neuroprotective effects because of that. But over the long term, in chronic use, I wouldn't say it's the best for cardiovascular disease. So I wouldn't use it like every day. I would use it like, you know, a few times a week and uh, stick to like a dose of, you know, one to two milligrams uh, at a time. If I'm not mistaken, the nicotine also has uh, benefits for testosterone. It uh, inhibits aromatase, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. So it could have like some testosterone boosting effects as well and lowers the aromatase activity. So yes, nicotine is an interesting compound alone. <laughs> you don't want to get the nicotine from cigarettes and smoking. Obviously, if you are interested in taking nicotine, then like the nicotine gums, one milligram, try it out. If you take it on an empty stomach, you might get nauseous um, and it can, you know, feel uncomfortable. But if you take it, you know, with food or something after food, then yeah, it can be a pretty good uh, nootropic agent and helps you to like, you know, focus on the work. And the final question is, do you still do OMAD? I absolutely love it and picture myself doing it long term. Is it viable? I haven't been doing like a strict OMAD for the last, you know, six years. Like I said, I've always done my version of OMAD, which I call targeted intermittent fasting. I have a protein shake before my workout then I work out and in the evening around 5 p.m. or something, I'll have my dinner. So it's, you know, one and a half meals a day. I consume most of the calories after the workout because I think that's where my body is most insulin sensitive and that's where my body uses the nutrients the most. And there is some benefits to working out semi-fasted uh, by activating AMPK and working out in a glycogen depleted state. You, uh, I think that you will gain like some super compensation effects as well in terms of the longevity pathways and uh, metabolic health, obviously. But it's uh, not very smart or it's hard to work out fasted all the time. So that's why I have the protein shake, which gives me around 30 grams of protein. And uh, that is enough to make progress and build muscle and gain strength at the same time. And then I'll have the rest of my calories in the evening. I don't eat too many calories. I eat maybe 2,200 um something like 2200 calories per day and that maintains a lean body composition year round for me while still having a high amount of muscle mass and a high amount of muscle strength as well so i think i'm for me it works perfect to get the best best of both worlds in terms of body composition and training and uh, the longevity side now is the regular omad viable for long term 
uh, at least you know the way I do it, it's been viable for the last six or seven years. <laughs> so I, ha I haven't seen any you know uh, problems with that. But uh, regular OMAD of eating strict one meal a day depends. Yeah, like how much you train. If you don't have a particularly strenuous exercise routine and you're not super lean, then you can probably do it quite long. Uh, if you're overweight, then you can easily do OMAD. If you're not working out, then you can easily do OMAD. But if you start to be more advanced in your training, whether that be cardio training or strength training, then you will see, you will need something extra, in my opinion, at least in terms of maintaining muscle tissue and getting enough protein. Because yes, eating just one meal a day isn't optimal for protein synthesis and muscle growth and muscle building. But uh, adding like a protein shake or just eating two meals in total instead of one meal uh, can overcome that. So, you know, it depends a lot on your training status, your metabolic health and your body fat percentage. The lower your body fat percentage, then uh, it's better to get an additional meal. But the higher your body fat percentage, then you can easily do OMAD for a longer time, if that makes sense. All right, that's it for this uh, video. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at seamlun.com. But do you want to slow down aging and add healthy years to your life? Then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. But other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.